Welcome to today's webinar. It is the first in a series on freedom of expression in Asia that we will be running approximately quarterly over the next two years. The idea for the series came originally from Matthew Hedges, who some of you may remember was detained by the UAE in 2018 while conducting research for his PhD. Matthew has been closely involved in the development of the series, which has taken two years to bring to fruition. For this first event, we are looking at Iran, where questions about the nature of state authority and freedom of expression have loomed large since the revolution in 1979. Those of you who know Iran will be well aware that it is by no means a monolithic state. Some of the complexity in Iran's relations with other countries, particularly the United States and its Western allies, arises out of the multi-layered nature of Iran's institutions. And we're very pleased indeed to welcome as our panelists today, Professor Mohsen Kadivar and Ramita Navai. Uh, Mohsen Kadivar is a research professor of Islamic studies at the Department of Religious Studies at Duke University. And his interests span both classical and modern Islamic thought, and he's published prolifically in Persian and English. He had a prominent academic career in Iran, but became increasingly critical of the regime. And after a period of imprisonment, and restrictions on his ability to teach, he took up a position at the University of Virginia in 2008 and has been in the United States ever since. His publications have been banned in Iran since 2009 and he was formally stripped of his academic positions there in 2011. Ramita Navai is an Emmy and Robert F. Kennedy Award winning British Iranian journalist, documentary producer and author. Her first book, City of Lies, Love, Sex, Death, and the Search for Truth in Tehran won the debut Political Book of the Year at the 2015 Political Book Awards and was awarded the Royal Society of Literature's Jerwood Prize for Nonfiction. It has been translated into six languages. With a reputation for working in hostile environments, she has reported from over 40 countries, made over 30 documentaries and features, and worked as a correspondent for print. Her latest documentary, she reported and executive produced Afghanistan Undercover for PBS Frontline and No Country for Women for ITV in 2022. It won the Grierson Award for Best Current Affairs Documentary, as well as the Rose Door Award. And moderating today's discussion, uh, but slightly delayed in joining us, is Professor Anusha Tashami, who is well known to members of the RSAA, having spoken to us on many previous occasions. He is Nassar al Mohammed al Sabah Chair in International Relations at Durham University, where he is also the director of the Institute for Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies. Our panelists will take questions after their presentations, and if you wish to put questions to them, please use the QA button at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to respond to as many of you as possible. But for now, I will hand over to Professor Kadava to start. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Michael, for your good introduction. And thanks so much for inviting me to this wonderful event. Uh, so the topic of my presentation today is, as you see, freedom of expression in Iran. And I will like, talk about this picture later or to explain what's the meaning of it and what is behind it. So I start with some data. The first data is freedom of expression and belief in Iran, 2022. It's based on Freedom House data, one of the most, I think, authentic data that we can find today in the world. So there are four questions, major questions here about Iran. First, and it's about all countries, and these answers are all only about Iran. Are there free and independent media in Iran? No, zero from four. Are individuals free to practice and express their religious non-belief non in public and private? 
Unfortunately, no. Zero from four. Is there academic freedom? And is the educational system free from extensive political introduction, introductory nation? One from four. It means so weak. Are individuals free to express their personal views on political or other sensitive topics without fear or surveillance or retribution? Unfortunately, no, zero from four. So in the same data, global freedom in Iran in 2022 was 12 from 100. 12%. Last year, it means if the, the year before that, 2021, it was 14 from 100. It means decline. If you want to have a better understanding about countries that are close in Iran, in their culture, religious, political, economic, affairs, I mentioned two countries from the same data, Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan. In 2022, the position of Saudi Arabia was eight, and Afghanistan also eight. It means that the situation of Iran is a little bit better than Saudi Arabia and Afghanistan in the freedom of expression. But all of these countries are in the lowest position in the table of freedom of expression in the world. So this is the first data. And because if we want to have a good analysis, we need correct data. And second data that is, I think, are more detailed. And this is from Varieties of democracy. I think this is one of the best data sources in the world about democracy and its elements. So I explain some data from this database. General ranking of Iranian regimes since 1972. It's so important that we compare Iran before revolution and after revolution. So. There are four types of regimes in this database. Liberal democracy, electoral democracy, electoral autocracy, and closed autocracy. Unfortunately, Iran is neither in the first category, liberal democracy, nor in the second category, electoral democracy. It was between electoral and closed autocracy. But more details. What do we mean by close or electoral autocracy, the third and the fourth types of regime in the, regimes in the world? Both of them has multi-party elections for the executive. At least there is something in the name of uh, elections for the executive, but the more relative item to our discussion today, absence of fundamental democratic components that I will explain in close autocracy and insufficient levels of fundamental democratic components in electoral autocracy. The difference between these two electoral and close autocracy is between absence or insufficient levels of these fundamental democratic components. There are at least three types of fundamental democratic components here. First, freedom of expression. This is our subject today. Freedom of association and free and fair elections. Okay, I will not talk a lot about the second and the third one, but I focus on the first one, freedom of expression. And if you want to summarize 
the history of Iranian regime since 1972. It's about half a century. 1972 to 1979, it means that in the end of Pahlavi regime, Iran was closed autocracy, the first one. After revolution, 1979 by 2021, three years ago, electoral autocracy. It means the situation of Iran in democracy and freedom of expression was a little bit better than the first period. That Iran since 2021, it's clothed autocracy. It means from the beginning of the presidency of Ibrahim Raisi. Okay. These are in the second column. You can see the Iran sources for democracy index and detail components in 2022. Because now we are into 2023. At the end of this year, we will have the data of this year. Okay. There are 177 countries. What is the ranking of Iran in these different details? Liberal Democracy Index, Iran's rank is 149 through 177. And this score is 0.1. Electoral Democracy Index, Iran's ranking is 151 through 177. It's a score 0.18. Liberal Component Index, Iran's ranking is 144. Its score is 0.31. Egalitarian Component Index, Iran's rank is 112. The score is 0.53. Participatory Component Index, the rank is so low, 172 through 177. The score is 0.11. And deliberative component index, its rank, Iran's rank is 150. The score is 0.26. So as you see, the situation of, of Iran is not good, is bad. Okay. We this is two data that I can talk about them and know. I focus a little bit on my analysis. The cause of the lack of freedom of expression in Iran. Okay, if you remember, I mentioned from varieties of democracy data, two important points, absence of freedom of expression and insufficient levels of freedom of expression in Iran. The first one, absence, before the revolution and since in Islamic Republic of Iran, since 2021. And insufficient levels of freedom of expression between 1979 and 2021. What happened in Iran in 2021 that we are in this situation and we should talk more about this period? Iran started a non-competitive electoral authoritarian regime. So, or the other name is closed autocracy in 2021. What do I mean by non-competitive electoral authoritarian regime? It means that in the first decade of Islamic Republic of Iran, especially in the recent three decades, we had competitive electoral. Also, the regime was authoritarian regime, that the election, especially the parliament election and presidential election were competitive. We have some examples. 
when Iranian could elect Muhammad Khatami or Hassan Rouhani. So the first one was a reformist uh, president, and the second one was a moderate president. So it means that uh, there was some competition, real competition, because the authoritarian regime did not like none of them, neither Khatami nor Rouhani. And the option of regime was someone else. In the first one was Ali Akbar Natiq Nuri, and in the second one was Ibrahim Raisi. So it means that Iranian elected someone that the authoritarian regime disliked. It means that it was competitive. But in the last election, both parliament election and uh, presidential election, there was no one from reformist camp and also moderate camp that have some, I think, hope for election. It means that election could be predicted before the end. It was non-competitive electoral, electoral authoritarian regime. Okay, so my major point for this analysis is this one. What is the cause or what is the reason of lack of freedom of expression in Iran? Especially I'm talking about Islamic Republic of Iran, this regime. I think it has political causes and religious reasons, both. By political causes, I mean something that we should explore them in political sciences, in social sciences, in economics. By religious reasons, I mean that we should explore them in theology or philosophy, not in social sciences. And you know the difference between cause and reason. So cause is something related to social sciences, including political sciences, and reason is something that is related to philosophy and theology. So in my understanding, in my research, in my surveys, I found that the role of political, social, economic causes is much, much more than the theological, philosophical reasons, especially in the case of Islamic Republic of Iran. Although the regime tried to do something like this, the political intentions have been weaponized or justified with religious reasons. In their media, governmental media, we heard a lot about justification of all of these, I think, restrictions in the case of freedom of expression by religious reasons, theological reasons, but the reality is something else. It has political causes, much, much more than the religious reasons. But I discussed the religious reason elsewhere. This is the topic of my recent article on this issue, Free Speech and Critic of Religion in Contemporary Islam, 2021. Also, before that, I wrote a book on apostasy and blasphemy in Islam, and also the human rights and reformist Islam, including the freedom of expression. So both of them also were released in 2021 by Edinburgh University Press. So I, I try to spend the remainder of my time only on political causes on this issue. So in this slide, you can see the red lines of freedom of expression uh, in Iran. Uh, as you see the picture in the beginning of my presentation, you can see here, I wrote an 
Persian article in 2021. Prohibition of publication and the red lines of freedom of expression in you. I explained in detail and I give you the abstract of that uh, article. The red lines of freedom of expression are not the violence of any Islamic or Shiite dogmas. In contrast to our imagination, maybe our imagination, that we think that, okay, if someone, for example, wrote something about the Quran or the principles of Islam, about God, about revelation, about prophecy of Muhammad, about the resurrection, about all of these Islamic or about Shiite Imams. So are they the red lines of Islamic Republic or the red lines or something else? So practically, not theoretically, with a lot of data, I reach this point. This red line of freedom of expression in Iran has only two particulars, not three, not four, only two. The first one is the theory of absolute guardianship of the jurist. So absolute guardianship of the jurist. This is political theory of Islamic Republic of Iran. If you write something against this, criticize it, this is the first line. It's not tolerated. The second one, it's about the particular of this theory, the jurist ruler or the leader of the regime. They call it supreme leader within power. If you criticize him, it's justified. It's criticism of Islam. You criticize the political leader of the country that is translated or justified, it, this is against Islam. So Islam here means the leader, the supreme leader, and the political theory of the regime. Okay. Any criticism, even the soft one of the leader or the official theory is not tolerated and suppressed in the severest way. Zero tolerance about these two major points. So if I want to give you an example, I'm one of the examples of the victim of freedom of expression in Iran. I give you three examples of my publication about this book, about this point, and what happened after publication of those books. These are about these two points that I mentioned. I think that I criticize deeply both of them. So this is the first one. It's about criticism of the theory of absolute guardianship of the jurist. This is, I think, one of the most important books that were written on criticism of the political theory of Islamic Republic of Iran, and particularly the theory of Ayatollah Khomeini. So I published it in Iran when I was in Iran in the time of presidency of uh, Muhammad Khatami in 1999. And the second edition of it in 2002. In 2009, I was banned. It means that I could not publish, also I could not uh, reprinting of this book. But after that, five books were published in criticism of this book. And it means that I could not published, I could not print my book in Iran, but the criticism of it was completely free. And you can see the names of these books. And this is the covers of this book. So the translation of this book is forthcoming and will be published by Cambridge University Press. The second one is 
It's about impeaching Iran's supreme leader. So I, I could not publish it in Iran. I published it as a web book on my website in 2014. And in the right, you can see this is a book that was printed in Iran by one of the members of the leader's office in Tehran. So it means that criticism of my book is free to be published. By my book was not free to be published. And the last one, it's also another impeaching the supreme leaders, but in his uh, religious authority. So uh, I published it on my website in 2015. And two books later were published in print in Iran in criticism of my book. It means that I cannot publish my criticism of the leader or the his theory in Iran, but any criticism on my books would be published freely and without, and they are awarded for them. Yes. So these are the best examples that you can think about the freedom of expression in Iran. This is the end. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Mohsen. And um, uh, I will hand over uh, now to Ramita. In the meantime, uh, Anusha Tashami has joined us, and I'm glad uh, there he is. Um, uh, that, that's his personal yacht on the screen behind him there. Um, <laughs> uh, all, all five of them, Michael, actually. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I'll come back to you shortly, Anush, if I may, to to uh, to, to to help sort of discuss these uh, the, the the sort of interesting presentation. But for the moment, uh, uh, Ramita, please take over. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to speak about press freedom in Iran. A little background: I was the Tehran correspondent um, living in Iran from 2003 to 2006. Um, and I spent the seven years following that returning to Iran, either to report events um, like elections uh, or to research my book. So I thought I'd start by um, talking a little bit about my experience of working as a journalist in Iran, because I think it reflects the experience of, of many of my colleagues. So as a journalist, you are very heavily monitored um, by uh, Etelat, by intelligence, which I was. So you're forced to go to secret meetings um, where intelligence officers let you know that you're being closely monitored. And this is in order to intimidate and scare you. And it's uh, pretty effective. Um, you know the red lines. And actually, Professor Kadavar talked about these red lines. I'd like to expand on these red lines um, because you were talking about absolute red lines um, that are in law. So every single journalist in Iran knows the many red lines that are not necessarily in law, but could get you in trouble, could or could not get you in trouble. So, I mean, it's really broad. Corruption stories, story, econo certain, certain uh, economic stories, uh, women's rights, human rights, sex. Uh, as Professor Kadavar said, questioning the supreme leader, questioning Islam. Um, so, anything to do with society, politics, and culture, really, you have to be careful. Um, of course, there are more, there's more pressure on Iranian journalists than foreign journalists. I was there as an Iranian journalist, but even foreign journalists have to self-censor. So all the big foreign media organizations, uh, New York Times, BBC, Reuters, every single journalist there self-censors. No journalist in Iran can tell the whole truth what's happening on the ground. You can't report the truth if you're, if you're living and working as a journalist in Iran, even if you're a foreigner. So Iranian media is controlled by the state. Um, it's a propaganda tool. Uh, and my colleagues working for newspapers and the state media there were told what to report and how to report it uh, when papers didn't abide by the rules. They got shut down and raided. Um, also, independent papers, there are ways of making sure they abide 
uh, they'd have their advertising pulled, for example. Um, editors, of course, are less inclined, less and less inclined to take risks. Uh, a friend of mine, a friend and colleague of mine wrote a pretty anodyne article um, about women, single women in Iran and the difficulties of living on your own uh, in Iran. And her editor, um, who was a reformist, quite a moderate guy, absolutely refused to publish it because they, he knew what would happen. You know, advertisers would be pulled, they'd get into trouble. Had a pretty anodyne um, article. And actually, um, it's interesting, uh, the, the, the regime is very similar to the Taliban in that way, and they're very sensitive about women's rights, as we're seeing right now. So what does happen uh, if the truth gets out? What does happen if you cross these red lines, which of course journalists are always doing, we're always pushing the boundaries and trying to cross the red lines. Well, you'll all know that many journalists in Iran are in and out of prison. Uh, Iran um, is often uh, listed in the top 10 countries of, uh, of, of, of being the countries, the, 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 the worst jailers of journalists in, in the world. If you're a foreign journalist, uh, of course, you fare slightly better. Um, you just get kicked out. In fact, when I was there, a few foreign journalists were kicked out, including a Guardian journalist who was kicked out for writing about a political prisoner. I was lucky. I never got imprisoned. I was arrested um, a few times. I got in trouble a few times. Once I was arrested for covering the anniversary of the revolution. Um, wasn't very pleasant. I was interrogated for hours, forced to sign a confession, which was false. Um, and don't forget that this was not about an article I had written, but about an article intelligence was fearful. I may write. And the truth that day that didn't come out, um, and it's, a, it's a, a truth we now know, and I'm going to talk about how we do know things and how things are reported when there are so many red lines, um, was that that day uh, the regime supporters had been, had been bussed in. It was rent a crowd and they, and they didn't want anybody to know that. Uh, I also had my press card revoked in Iran, as many journalists do, for crossing the red lines. Um, you're not usually told what you've done. I was told in this case. So there were two things that I'd done. Uh, I'd written about um, an original revolutionary called Akbar Ganji, who turned uh, against the regime. They didn't like that. He'd been imprisoned. Um, they didn't want his case being international news. Um, and I'd also written about a film uh, called The Lizard, cult film um, that was later banned. And this brings me on to my second point which is um, how the rules are forever changing um, and how they're constantly shifting because the state makes them up as they go along. So these rules are basically uh, made up on a whim to suit the politics at the time and aren't based on law. That's why uh, my list of red lines is far longer, was far longer than Professor Kadivar's. Um, and that's why People do manage to push the red lines, and that's why stories do end up getting out. So I'll give you an example uh, of the lizard that I just mentioned. So originally, this film was passed by the censors. Um, so for those of you who don't know, every single line um, in every single film, song, every single artistic endeavor that is going to be presented to the public has to pass through the censors. And the censors had seen this film, The Lizard, and they had okayed it. And I had gone to see it at the cinema. Um, and of course, there's a joke at the expense of a cleric, which censors haven't picked up on. The censors don't always have a great sense of humor. And they don't always get symbolism in art. So they had uh, okayed this, this film. And of course, the, the, the public's reaction um, was 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 riotous and was quite amazing. Everybody stood up and cheered in the cinema at this particular joke uh, that was made at, uh, um, at the expense of a cleric. And I wrote about this and they didn't like that. Um, and there's another film which also shows you how these rules are random and how they work. Um, another film, I went to a premiere in Iran. Um, a friend of mine had uh, written and directed a film 
Um, it was quite a big deal. Censors had, 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 had watched this film many, many times and had given copious notes. And of course, again, there was a character in this film that represented the authoritarian, uh, patriarchal regime. And every single joke at his expense had the audience uh, laughing. The film was promptly banned. Uh, the director got in lots of trouble. Uh, faced charges and he was made to make uh, I think over a, a dozen cuts to the film basically um, every single instant that the audience had laughed. So stories, uh, sorry before I get on to how stories get out, another interesting, uh, 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 another interesting um, uh, area where laws constantly change is the words you can use. When I was in Iran uh, the word rape um, was banned. I think I think it's since been unbanned, but certainly it was banned because a male a colleague had written about a case where a revolutionary guardsman had raped a young boy. He was arrested. Um, his newspaper was threatened, and a missive was sent round to all media that the word rape was banned. Um, of course, not long afterwards. Um, there were front page stories using the word rape um, when state media had accused a BBC Persian editor of having raped his BBC uh, Persian colleague. Uh, of course, entirely untrue. It was part of a propaganda smear campaign, anti-BBC smear campaign. But you see how words can change, how laws can change, how there's law for the state and rules for everybody else, which are totally random. Another way stories get out is the regime's been really good at giving people just enough freedom to keep them quiet, uh, to give them just enough leeway for them to feel they have a certain degree of freedom of expression. But as we're seeing now, uh, the pot boils over. And to talk about now, so with what's happening now, the situation for journalists and freedom of press, as you can all imagine, and as you will all know, has only got much worse. Uh, according to reports without borders, Iran now ranks 177 out of 180. It's one of the world's most repressive countries in terms of press freedom. Journalists have been in and out of prison, as have ordinary Iranian citizens. At the last counts, about 30,000 Iranians have been imprisoned. Uh, many uh, we're hearing more and more reports that many have simply been imprisoned for um, expressing their political views, their support of the protests on social media. Um, journalists and Iranian citizens now for expressing political views are being further silenced. Uh, we know that in prisons, um, prisoners are being raped, tortured and beaten. Once a prisoner is out, there's further pressure to silence people. So many are losing their livelihoods. So their bank cards are take, getting uh, confiscated, uh, their passports and IDs. Um, Iranians, when they come out of prison, are losing their jobs. Their families have had to ha hand over the deeds uh, to their houses. Um, and they're left, many Iranians are being left destitute and unable to be functioning members of the, uh, uh, of society. State TV now is just a, it's state TV has always been a propaganda tool and now it's really uh, gone up a notch. I don't know if anybody's been watching state TV, but there was, a, there was a period a few weeks ago when it just was 24 hour forced confession, forced confessions of, of protesters and their families. Um, and of course, I want to mention the two female journalists, Nilfan um, Hamadi and Elahe Mohammadi, um, whose work, uh, got them imprisoned um, in October last year. Now, these two women, working for separate uh, newspapers, are the two women that are responsible uh, for the footage that went viral, sparking these nationwide protests. Um, Nilufar took the picture of Masa Amini's parents uh, outside her hospital room, um, which went viral, um, and Elahe uh, took the footage of Masa Amini Jina's um, mother at her graveside. Um, they are being tried right now uh, on various charges, including colluding with hostile powers. On that note, I will end by saying there is no freedom of expression 
in Iran. A little doesn't count. And you can't have freedom of expression without freedom of the press. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Anush, uh, would you be uh, willing to take it from there? I think you can probably see that there's a question already in the, the Q&A uh, box from, um, uh, from Hookie Walker. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Michael. Before we get to Q&A, can I thank you and, and uh, the Royal Society for bringing us together to have such important discussion? And of course, to, to, to thank our two distinguished speakers, Professor Karivar and Ms. Nabai, for their presentations, both of which I enjoyed enormously, coming at, at it rightly from very different perspectives and experiences. Um, both have also suffered um, through, through the idiosyncrasies of this regime, which is perhaps where I want to, to start by making just a couple of comments before going to Ambassador Walker and then others. Uh, first is, you know, authoritarian regimes are clumsy uh, and they're often very dumb. Um, they're reactive, they're paranoid, but as a consequence of those things, they're also very dangerous and predict unpredictable. And that we've seen in what my colleagues have already uh, set out. So expression, I mean, you, you presage the discussion today, Michael, by having freedom of expression, as they call it. But I would say expression of any sort, actually, in that environment is highly problematic, whether it is free or not, because author authoritarian regimes like to set the parameters um, for anything that is that is seen to be uh, supportive or questionable. But I would say Iran is also a unique authoritarian regime in that uh, it has added to its authoritarian nature a, a very real layer of overtly religious, but as Professor Karibri has said, but narrowly defined parameters of religion, religious identity that it has monopolized as its core values. And that makes the place even more unpredictable and, 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 and in many ways unfathomable. Here, I would argue, if my colleagues agree, that we must broaden the boundaries of our discussions about freedom of expression to include a much broader narrative about such things as individualism. Where does individual fit in this authoritarian order? Gender. Gender, being a woman, I would submit to Ramita, is actually quite, quite a, a, um, a challenge uh, in this regime that men probably only see from afar, but women experience the lack of expression on a daily basis in both private and public uh, realms. Um, group behavior is an expression of sorts. Public conduct is an expression of sorts. Protest, whether in support of the regime or against it, are both expressions of sorts. Resistance, whether it is silent resistance, as was the case in 2009, or active resistance, as it is now since 2018-19, and now as we go forward, is also a form of protest. Performance, as we've just heard from Ramita, is a very powerful expression uh, of protest and a cry um, for freedom. But also withdrawal of labor to take strike action is incredibly brave expression of freedom in a system like this. And when we broaden the boundaries of our discussions, you'll see that actually, the challenge is a societal challenge in the case of Iran. And that is why within the boundaries, within the confines of its own very limited elite structure, there are now very vocal voices coming out to say, not to reform this regime, but to uproot it. And they're not necessarily revolutionary. They are realists in my view, who recognize that there isn't, there isn't a potential of reform of the sorts that, that the rest of the world and Iran's 80 million plus people want 
in the ways that this regime has come to put boundaries around what is permissible and what is not. And with that in mind, I, I, I very much endorse what my colleagues have said and look forward to what will be a hopefully fruitful and rich discussion. Um, you have said that Ambassador Walker has got a question. Uh, I am not seeing it. Uh, well, let me read it out then. Um, I think, uh, Ravita, this, this question probably relates to your own experience. Um, uh, as Harold Walker asks, it says it's an easy question to ask, perhaps not very easy to answer, but what is it that persuades an independent journalist to make a confession? Um. <laughs> So first of all, I, I've just read that question, and here it says an independent foreign journalist. So uh, I was in Iran working as a journalist as an Iranian citizen, um, not as a foreign journalist. Had I had a British passport, I think I would have been far more forthright in not signing uh, a false confession. And, you know, with all the uh, prisoners recently and dual nationals saying that, you know, this is the modus operandi of the regime, that they've so upset that they've signed false confessions. I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, at the time, I was at the start of my career, so I don't know whether I'd be so easily scared and threatened now as I was then, but I was really scared. They threatened me when they interrogated me. Um, they threatened me with a beating. Uh, there were sexual connotations to um, the, 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 the interrogation sessions. And actually afterwards, one of my interrogators uh, sexually harassed me for quite a long time uh, on the phone. Um, I reported it in the end and in the end that, that, that it did stop. But in that moment, you know, as a young kind of budding journalist at the start of my career that had never come across an authoritarian state like this, all these years later, I have, and I've been arrested many times in different parts of the world by nasty people. Um, so I like to think I wouldn't be so scared, but I was actually terrified. And by the way, right then, and I, my, my, per, my reading of Persian still isn't brilliant. I can't read handwriting very well. Um, I can read um, um, uh, printed Persian, but not handwriting. And so I couldn't really read everything uh, anyway. Uh, that I, I was signing. I didn't understand it all. But uh, by that point, yeah, I, I was prepared to sign anything because I thought that, you know, I was going to get beaten or raped or imprisoned. Um, and so, yeah, the tactics work. Mohsen, would you like to add anything? Uh, yes. Thank you, Anush. <laughs> I think... There are two understandings of red lines in Iran, and I think both of them are correct. We have many red lines, not only two, but we have zero tolerance red lines and also some somehow tolerated red lines in some degrees. I give you some examples about sex, about hijab about all of these points that you said about gender, individuality, group, about uh, protests, about all of things. I think there are red lines in Iran. Right. I completely, absolutely agree. But in the books that they were published in Iran, we can find some examples about some of them that it could be published. Maybe they ignore it or maybe did not find it or any other reasons. But about these two particulars that I mentioned, there are zero tolerance. It means we have censorship about all of these, about, as you say, it's unpredictable regime, unpredictable. It means that sometimes in the poetry of Hafiz or poetry of Rumi or Saadi, you should remove this word about the rape, as Ramita said, or about something else. Okay, this is our literature, we cannot do it. But they pushed to remove something from these poetry. It was said as a joke in Iran, if Ferdowsi or Hafiz or Saadi or Rumi were here in this time, they could not publish their poetry, their books. Why? Because they're crossing the red lines. Okay, I understand. 
But in my article, I mentioned that we can find someone that criticized revelation, the Quran, God, Imams, Prophet, and they could somehow publish their works. But when they wanted to criticize the theory, the political theory of the regime or the supreme leader, zero tolerance. tolerance. They could not do anything. I think in this, we can have a bridge between me and Hiramito and these red lines that uh, she was absolutely correct. And this was my understanding. Uh, may, may I ask you uh, each a question? Uh, Professor Kadivar, you know, you're, you're, you're well known uh, for your writings and your background. Uh, for someone like me and many others outside, to, to fully appreciate how has Jose's free thinking ended would be really interesting. This used to be the space where, by very nature, the debate was challenging, that actually uh, the, the Talib were encouraged to debate, to ask questions, to look for answers through a, a wide-ranging set of debates. And, and the Jose was known for for decades, for innovation and so on. How did, how did what was seen by many to be such an independent institution become so, so strangulated? I think it's a big, big question. Also, the answer is not so easy. Uh, I think that innovation and also any creative thinking is impossible under dictatorship. This is a very important point. For five centuries, that was mentioned in the name of golden times of Islam. We have Khayyam, we have Zakaria Rabi, we have all of these thinkers. They wrote something in, um, uh, in opposition of the mainstream of their time, but they were free. They could publish their works. And there was nothing, no risk for them in their life. But today, after revolution, I think that they cannot tolerate any different ideas, any dissidents. It means that, okay, why did you write this? Why did you write that? In, when I was in the court, I was asked, I give you some real example. Why did you say that Muhammad Musaddiq was a Muslim? Can you imagine this? No. Why? Because Ayatollah Khomeini said he was not a Muslim. We told him, okay, you should keep him to the court, ask him, how can you prove that a Muslim was not a Muslim? This is something that uh, I think the service of Musaddiq to Iran, no one can deny in the time of the, the oil uh, organization that he has the freedom on that time. So this was one thing. And other thing, when I was in the court, say, okay, it was six months after releasing my book in criticism of the guardianship of the jurist Hukumat Velay. And he mentioned the judge said, okay, be careful. It is not because of your book. I said, I know you are saying this, but I'm sure it, it's because of my book. There's no any other reason that I'm here. So uh, all of my books, why I published web books for more than 10 years. So my custom, the reader are in Iran, but I cannot publish them in Iran. So this is, I think, the best example for this. So according, uh, returning to your question, I think any creative ideas could not be produced under this regime. Why? Because they do not tolerate any different ideas. We should repeat them, nothing else. If you say something different, not in opposition of them, you are not tolerated. And this is, I think, because of the, this, we have a lot of Iranian scholars in diaspora, out of Iran, maybe much more than what we have in Iran. Most of Iranian full professors are now in US or Europe, not in Iran. 
among the doctors, among the nurses, among businessmen. This is, I, I think, this is the real crisis that we have in the, this country. Uh, does does this also permeate within the religious community? Uh, I, I have in mind what's going on in Najaf and Karbala, for example, where they, they if you like, the, the religious regime there is very different from the religious regime in Iran. Do you see tensions between between what's going on in religious circles in Iran and, and what's going on in Iraq? Uh, we can compare these two countries because today we do not have religious regime in Iraq. The, and this is something, a secular regime that we have in Iran. But in Iran, it's called religious regime. Also, this is the appearance of it. But in reality, after uh, regime interest, I think this is in essence a secular regime too, but in the name of Islam. Yeah. So what we have two major uh, Shiite uh, centers in Iran and Iraq, Um and Najaf. Mm. And it's in interesting to know some, I think, Iranian religious uh, scholars uh, immigrated to Najaf. Why? Because they cannot uh, Briefs in Iran. They cannot write. They cannot teach. Give you an example. So there is a topic in Iran in Shiite seminaries, in Shiite faith about Velayat al Faqih, guardianship of the Jews. So at least I give you the name. This is not imaginary. When the, these Shiite authorities reached to this subject, they, they, they said, okay, sorry, students. We cannot discuss it. And they jumped to the next subject. The first one was, Ayat, was Ayatollah Hussein Wahid Khurasani. Mm -hmm. He's number one Shiite authority now in Iran. More than 4,000 students attended in his class. This is number one. And the second one that is passed away was Ayatollah Falsafi. He was the brother of that Falsafi that was a preacher. He was in Masha. He said the same thing that he did not discuss the light of Fabi. Why? They are not free. Because if they mention some criticism to this subject, after that, those besieged came to and they stopped their teaching. And I give you another example when they wanted to publish the books of the founder of Shiite seminary the teacher of Ayatollah Khomeini, Sheikh Abdul Karim Hayri Yazdi. He was one of the critics of the Laita Faqih. When they wanted to publish his book, they removed this section without any explanation from the book. The book was written by Sheikh Muhammad Ali Araki, the student of Ayatollah uh, Abdul Karim Hayri. I mentioned in some of my articles, in this part, you remove it. I found that removed part, I publish it on my website. So this is, I think, this is freedom of expression, not only about secular issues, not about gender issues. It's exactly about jurisprudence, about religion, about other issues. I think these restrictions are more severe for religious scholars than non-religious scholars. I gave you the examples and the facts, and you can go and read them. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Mohsen. Really, really appreciate the insights that you bring. Uh, Ramita, uh, uh, I'm in awe of people who, uh, who, individuals, men and women, who want to become journalists in any authoritarian environment. Um, and Iran is no exception in that regard. And yet there are so many journalists there. Uh, can you bring a bit of... Um, insight for us about what motivates individuals who know the risks to their individual family community for taking action. Some obviously are self-serving, there's a job, right? But for others who begin to raise questions, what are the, the motivations behind it? It cannot be fame or fortune, clearly. Um, and yet there are so many, as you already uh, alluded to, to individuals who are suffering. Uh, in your encounters and your experiences, where does this, this you know, groundswell uh, come from? 
Um, so I've found that the more authoritarian and repressive and oppressive uh, a government, a country, a regime, um, the braver its journalists and the more motivated they are to get the truth out, actually. And that's what you find with my colleagues in Iran who take huge risks and my colleagues in Afghanistan who are doing the same. But unfortunately, what we've seen in both countries uh, is that journalists have just, you know, been, been have gone to ground uh, because of brilliant campaigns waged by these governments and these states to silence them. And by killing them and by arresting them, you can silence them. Um, Anush, I would like uh, just to end on one observation, actually, sparked by what you, and it's not to do with journalism, um, but it's sparked by what you were saying um, about uh, people protesting this lack of freedom of expression. And it's a really important point. And it's where freedom of expression does exist in Iran. And it's subversive and it's below the radar and it's illegal. And this lack of freedom of expression has really caused this ripple effect in um, sexual changes. So it was in uh, cult socio-cultural changes to society where freedom of expression can be found in sexual relations now. And there is this kind of, I wouldn't call it a sexual revolution, um, but there is this kind of sexual awakening happening in Iran because there is a lack of freedom of expression and there has been uh, uh, oppression to this degree where the state um, controls its citizens' most intimate affairs and thoughts. And it was interesting, I spoke to protesters who told me that during the 2009 uprising, so of course these are middle-class Iranians, but ordinary middle-class Iranians, I'm not talking about kind of rich uptown ones, and they told me that a lot of them really enjoyed uh, having sex with each other in a way they never had, because that was their one-fingered salute to the regime. You can control my thoughts, my social media, you can't control my body. And this has really changed and is changing society in Iran. So virginity, and I spent a lot of time researching attitudes towards sex. Virginity is not what it used to be. And, and I spent a lot of time, not just with middle class Iranians, but with, you know, Iranians, working class Iranians, Iranians from more religious families. And I, it's a real trickle down effect of how uh, this younger generation, how their att attitudes to sex are changing. And of course, this has a knock on effect when it comes to all of the freedoms that they are demanding and full freedom of expression. I, I think that's a really, really important and powerful point to be making, uh, because we all remember the young people expressing in dance uh, in the first instance, mixed dancing as part of this kind of resistance, for want of a of a better term. Uh, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I share with you very much this 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 kind of looking forward to what's going on, and it has two huge consequences. One, uh, Aramita, is for social change, that actually, unlike virtually all of its neighbors, bar Saudi Arabia, I would say, I think Saudi Arabia is also going through its own very interesting revolution, social revolution. But of all the countries around Iran, Iranian society seems to be breaking down taboos and boundaries in ways that was probably unmanageable, unmanageable un some some five years ago even. Um, so post current aging elite, how is this new, the next generation of rulers, going to manage this? That's a question for you, Ramita, and for Mohsen. I wonder what will a post harmony. Uh, um, Islam look like where there is such a mismatch between a regime's version of Islam and what is increasingly highly secular society 
Um, uh, you know, the regime has created so many nooses for itself uh, that I wonder how you see these nooses will eventually strangle it or will it find ways uh, out, out of these? I don't know who wants to go first. Please do. I'm happy to go first. Um, I, I'll I'll be brief. This is the million dollar question, really, and I'd be interested in hearing what Marcin has to say from a religious perspective. Um, I think, and maybe this is wishful thinking, that it will hang itself. Um, I think it's unsustainable. Mm. I think because of these socio-cultural changes that are happening, because of the youth, we keep hearing, I mean, we see the videos, we speak to our friends, we hear the accounts of how this younger generation is fearless. You know, they are very different to even my generation. And I think this generation, the regime will not be able to contain. But what happens next? You know, it's impossible to predict. Uh, when this uprising started, many of my esteemed colleagues predicted a year. But of course, I think we would all, probably all agree that we could see that it was going to be way longer than a year. I can't see the regime falling anytime soon. But I think when people say there is no going back, I think there's an element of truth to that. Thank you. Mohsen. Okay. I want to mention two points. First, in continuing what Ramita mentioned, and second, responding to your question. The first one, I agree with her. Uh, there, was, there is a novel was written by a British novelist, George Orwell. Mm. The, the author of Animal Farms. He wrote another novel in the name of 1984. Mm -hmm. I think what is happening in Iran is exactly the style of 1984 novels of Orwell. Yeah. It means that the Iranians are protesting the regime through something, through the social, cultural red lines of the regime including sex, including hijab, including other issues. This is something that they think that this is revolution. Also, this is, I think you, you mentioned something that revolutionary sex. This was exactly happened in the time of Stalin that was, I think, wrote, written by Orwell in that novel. And I agree with you that this is a reaction. We have two reactions among different generations of Iran exactly against imposing secularity, imposing Islamization. Mm. When the previous regime imposed secularity to Iranian, so the resistance of Iran was something like Islamic movement, Islamic revolution, Islamic actions, something like this. Today, after revolution, when the regime tried to impose Islamization to Iranians, so the new generation made this reaction, this is a secular reaction against this Islamization. It means Iranian does, Iranians do not like force. This is, I think, both regimes should pay attention. This is reaction to the force give you the freedom of choice. If the freedom of choice is this, this is their right. Or if this is that, this is also their right. Do not try to impose the style of life to Iranians. This is, I think, the first point that I wanted to say. The second, uh, responding to your, I think, uh, important question, the post homini Islam. I think this is something like post-Ottoman uh, situation that happened in Turkey. I think after Caliphate regime, after sixth century, what happened in Turkey? It means we have secular regime, but after several decades, I think Islamists came to power. It means that also this upper Turk and also those laicity style, not secularity style, because different between French style and American style of secularism. I think what happened after the Khamenei, this is something that 
separation between religious institution and a state, secular. I, I can tell you, I'm sure about it, that the future of Iran is secular. It's goodbye to political Islam. It means that I, the theory of Ayatollah Khomeini, more important than his political of guardianship jurist, it was merging Islam and politics. This is the time, I think, also in seminary, in Qom seminary, many scholars, many Shiite authorities reach this point that this is the time to separate these two from each other. I think this is more important than anything else. And But it does not mean that the people take their back to Islam. This is, they continue the exercising of Islam, but not through politics, through personal experience. It means Islam in the future of Iran will be a religion, not an ideology, right. not a political theory of the regime. I think this is if we have a referendum. Today, most of Iranians, I'm sure about more than 85%. And this is what it was released by the first news after this. This is not from us. This is from the regime itself. More than 85% of Iranians, I think, supporting some type of secularism. But it does not mean Iran will be non-religious countries. No, they will have their personal religiosity but not personal, not ideology, not political Islam. We should, I think, distinguish between political Islam and Islam as a religion. They are completely, absolutely different issues. We are back to the issue of individualism again, Mohsen. Yes, I agree yeah. with you. Yeah. This is, yeah. I think individual, individualism is ours. The, yeah. the governments cannot do anything in oh. any. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you both very much for that. Um, Michael, I have one other question to pose to our, to our uh, colleagues, uh, if I may. I see that you got your mic on. Uh, the question yes. is, give, given, given where we are, and, and you both now dare to look forward, as you both know, there is huge debate going on within and outside Iran about the role that sanctions have played in in in. in state-society relations in Iran. That's the angle that I'm particularly interested in. Were you to be asked by uh, capitals, uh, Brussels, London, Washington, and so on, do sanctions help restrict the regime? Or should we lift sanctions in order to encourage in, uh, broader social improvement in Iran? Where would your 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 balance of reasoning sit? Do sanctions hinder improvement in state society relations, or will lifting them help move the society relations forward? Three answers, please. So I so Iran has been under sanctions for so long; it's quite brilliant coping under sanctions but we know that now it's in pretty desperate situation and i think the only way forward now is complete isolation and strangulation of the regime and that is targeted sanctions to make it even harder for iran to operate in iran the regime must know that it cannot be a part of the international community while it is executing innocent iranians and imprisoning tens of thousands. So absolutely, I would not have said this uh, 20 years ago, um, but absolutely in speaking to many Iranian activists now, uh, the women's networks, political dissidents, um, I think most of them agree that absolute targeted sanctions is the only way forward. It's the only hope people have of regime change. Thank you, Amita. That is very clear. Mohsen? Okay, I have completely different ideas. Mm. It means that according to several academic surveys and analysis on the sanction, four centuries sanction uh, in, about this regime, the conduct of these sanctions were against Iranian citizens. And it was not against Iranian regime or uh, revolutionary guard. RIGC. 
it means that according to this, in, the, in my last class, I read some of these articles in, in the class with the students, and we reached this conclusion that the sanction was against middle class. It means, as you know, the producer of democracy in any countries, including Iran, is middle class. And the sanctions made a lot of difficulties and restrictions for the middle class. It means the sanctions, what was, it has these two, uh, I think, conclusions. First, it did not make anything about RIJC, Revolutionary Guard, or the regime. It strengthened them. You can see the military power of Iran in these four centuries. Did sanction do anything with this? No. What happened with them? I think this inflation, what is the result of this inflation? It's on the shoulder of the lower class and the middle class. So if we want, I think we should read this conclusion also not only by Iranians, some of them were written by Americans, by European, that what did the sanctions do with Iranian? It strengthened Iranian regime and revolutionary guard and weakened middle class and lower class. I absolutely against these type of sanctions. We should do something, something else against this authoritarian regime. We should, I think, the first priority of us in diaspora should something preserving the uh, something about middle class and lower class of Iran. We should not, we should not do something that make them a uh, difficulty for these two types of classes. If you have any answers, I can send this article for you to look at them and look what happened in each decade for Iranians and for Iranian regime. We should distinguish between these two. Sorry. Wonderful. Khamnabai, General Karibat, Khairi Mamnoon. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you for an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the discussion about sanctions could, of course, go on for a very long time. It's, a, it's been a staple of Western diplomacy in, uh, in recent decades. Um, there's certainly, I think, a case for saying that sanctions are more useful as an expression of, uh, uh, of um, distaste on the part of the people that apply the sanctions um, than it is uh, as an effective tool for, for persuading regimes to change. Um, but that's how Western foreign policy is made. So it's a very difficult one to crack. Unfortunately, we don't have more time today. Um, I, I would uh, like to... Um, uh, say to our audience, uh, this is the last of our webinars for the present. Our regular events will return in September. Uh, but in the meantime, for RSAA members, there is a meeting of our book club, the reading room, in two weeks' time on the 21st of June, when our chairman, Sophie Ibbotson, will be in conversation with Leon McCarran, talking about his journey along the river Tigris, looking at the threats to this hugely culturally and economically important river and what may be done to save it. And on the 11th of July, we hold our annual general meeting. We will be sending out information on that in the next few days, so please look out for it. The speaker at the AGM will be our president, Professor Peter Frankopan, who will be talking about his most recent book, The Earth Transformed, a study of the interaction between human societies and the environment throughout history. And it remains for me just to thank you, our audience, for being with us today and our three panelists for a really exceptionally interesting uh, discussion of a very complex and important topic. A recording of the discussion will be available on the RSAA's YouTube channel within the next few days, so if you missed any of it, I encourage you to catch up there. For now, however, thank you all once more, and goodbye. Thank you, thank you and goodbye. Thank you.